welcome to Chiropractic Science, where you get to hear interviews with leading chiropractic researchers from around the world. Hear about chiropractic research from the authors in plain English, not through the media, nor a middleman. My name is Dr. Dean Smith, and I am the host of Chiropractic Science. I'm a full clinical professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University, and I'm also a chiropractor in Eaton, Ohio. My research interests relate to understanding how chiropractic affects motor control and human performance. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Drs. Chris Malaya and Josh Hayworth. But before we get to the interview, I wanted to thank all of you who have subscribed to Chiropractic Science, and I'm especially appreciative to all of you who have contributed five-star reviews on iTunes. iTunes reviews really helps others to find out about chiropractic science. So if you like the show, please take a second and write a review. It will support chiropractors everywhere. Here's a review from Rabito, who says, The best. As a third-generation chiropractor currently finishing school, this podcast is exactly what I've been looking for. Hearing cutting-edge information from the superstar researchers that have elicited it is profoundly inspiring. I'll be a listener for life. Well, thanks, Rabito, for your review, and I look forward to sharing your iTunes review in a future podcast. All right, on to the podcast. Well, let's get on to the interview with Drs. Christopher Malaya and Josh Hayworth. Dr. Malaya is a research associate at Parker University in Dallas, Texas. He graduated from Parker in 2018 with a doctorate in chiropractic and is currently pursuing a PhD in motor control from the University of Houston. His current research interests are in sensory motor integration, postural control, and adaptation, as well as the neural mechanisms of manual manipulation. His overall goal is to help expand the foundational mechanisms and practical applications of manual joint manipulation as it relates to movement and neural rehabilitation. Dr. Hayworth's research focuses on the mechanisms responsible for the integration of sensory motor information in the production of human behavior. He uses eye tracking combined with motion capture and posture graphic measures to identify motor strategies used during daily tasks like upright standing, walking, and interpersonal communication. Extensions of his work include the identification of early indicators of clinical disorders and the production of novel therapeutic modalities. He has many active collaborations with colleagues in fields including chiropractic and pediatric rehabilitation technology. He is focused to better understand the development of motor and social cognitive skills in children with and without autism. Doctors Malaya and Hayworth, thanks so much for coming on the Chiropractic Science Podcast. Thank you. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Thank you. For sure. So I'd like to uh, get started with just some basic questions. Uh, I'm super excited to have you both on. We've worked together for uh, several years now, and I think our research, uh, I'm totally biased, but I think it it rocks, and I think it's super cool. (laughs) So, uh, but for those of, uh, for those listeners that have no idea what we've been up to, um, uh, let's, let's have a conversation about that. But I guess first things first, Chris, can you get us started with, uh, how you became interested in becoming a chiropractor? Absolutely. Um, so I had, I'd actually run into chiropractors off and on through college and I was a sprinter in college, so I enlisted as many people as I could to help put me back together after after meets. Um, but I was actually planning to go be a physical therapist. So I was working full time at a PT clinic in Austin. And as a completely random supplement to my clinical skills, I went to a rock tape seminar in Dallas. And I ran into a bunch of really, really great chiropractors. And I hadn't really considered it, but um, I found that oftentimes in healthcare, you find that that, you know, different groups fight over who can do what best. You know, I'm surgeon, I'm the best, or I'm a chiropractor, I'm the best. And and this particular group really had nothing to do with that. They were just very positive about what chiropractic could do. And I found that really refreshing. And so I decided kind of on a whim to look into it. And actually, when I was when I was thinking about it, PT was still a master's level degree. So I decided that a doctorate in chiropractic could afford me potentially more of the opportunities I wanted. So I decided to apply to Parker University. I quit my job at the PT clinic, it was accepted. And uh, here we are. That's awesome. I know we're going to get into to more things of what you've been up to since then and since chiropractic school. 
but Josh, how about you? Um, can you give us some background about your your life and research and and why you study what you do? Yeah, so my uh, my life is really a driving force. The experiences I've had um, and the ambition I have to understand how and why the world works. What do I need to do to get better at the movement skills that I'm trying to learn? Um, I actually grew up with uh, a congenital skeletal deformation, leg perthes disease that had me in a cast and a wheelchair for a couple of years as a child. Uh, so I, I kind of had a separate, a distance perspective on what it was to move and learn how to move. I was still an athlete in high school as a wrestler and cheerleader, uh, a cheerleader in college. And in both of those sports, you kind of have to move intentionally with a, a, a cooperative agent. As a wrestler, you're trying to win the match. As a cheerleader, you're trying to win the skill that you're trying to execute. And so I kind of had these experiences and just had a, just a, a burning drive to understand how does, how does the brain predict the outcome of an attempted movement, controlling the muscles, moving the skeleton, having a, a competition or cooperation. And, and so it, at the time I was uh, pursuing medicine or physical therapy as a profession and uh, had an opportunity in a biomechanics lab there at Miami University and kind of fell in love with the discipline and just being able to measure movement. And, uh, you know, it just kept going. I had an opportunity, thrived, loved it. And uh, here we are. Added some uh, complexity math, uh, chaos math, complexity science perspectives to it. And uh, that with this great team of chiropractors and um, continue on trying to figure out what it is to to create movement intentionally for outcomes. Um, currently applying that perspective to many different uh, clinical cases, osteoarthritis, cancer survivorship, uh, autism, uh, perseverative behavior, uh, and, and trying to find, find the path to champion for physical medicine um, through research. Great. That's awesome. Uh, so thanks to both of you for that. And I guess, uh, you know, Josh just brought it up about uh, essentially how we got together and, and uh, whatnot. So Chris, maybe you can, maybe you can wrap it up for us. Tell us uh, how we all got together uh, through Katie Pullman. And uh, it's really a show, I think, sometimes between the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how this works. So <laughs> can you tell the audience how, how we all got together? Yeah. So this is, this is a really funny story actually. And this is actually a bit wrapped up into how I got into research. Um, I was actually in a class at Parker the trimester before starting clinical work. And I had gotten tired basically of, of having questions that everyone would say, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that. And oftentimes I would get something along the lines of, you know, maybe you should do a study on that. Or um, I kept getting directed towards the, the Parker Research Institute. And so finally, on a, on a complete whim, I turned to my friend Cody Powell, who you both know, who is co-author on, on the first paper we had. And I just said, do you want to walk over to the Research Institute and see what's going on? Right? We've got these good ideas. You know, I know nothing about research, but I thought I had good ideas. And let's see what they say. So he's always game. So we kind of trundle over there. And, and as it turns out, students didn't really seem to do things like that. So everyone was very kind of surprised and perplexed. We had walked in and we actually got right in to see Katie, uh, Dr. Catherine Pullman, who's the director of research at, at Park University. And very funny, she promptly told us that they couldn't take any additional student projects. And uh, we thanked her and we went back to our class and stopped thinking about it. And about a week later, I got an email from her that said they'd completed a few projects ahead of schedule. And if I was still interested, that we could kind of go forward with it. And Cody and I had just entered midterms and we were trying to get ready for clinics. So we basically said, no way, right? And like, it'd be really silly to add more work. We got to focus on clinic. And so I actually went over to talk to Katie with, with Cody and, and with every intention of saying thanks, but no thanks. And then going on our merry way. And we all sat down and we started talking. We talked for an hour or so. 
And we really got swept up into each other's enthusiasm for, for the topics we had and the ideas. And so we decided that we'd just go ahead with it. We'd give it a try. And because Katie didn't have any dedicated expertise in motor control, um, she very kindly asked if she could bring you in, Dean. And I very quickly agreed to that because, again, I had no idea what I was doing at the time. And then you brought in Josh, who you knew from before. And as it turns out, we uh, all got along incredibly well, and we found we could really work well together. And in my completely biased opinion, we've put out some really interesting work. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, these events happen for a reason. <laughs> I'm convinced of that. And uh, you're right. I think it's some interesting trajectories we're on in terms of research and life. And uh, so why, I'm curious, uh, I know why I study motor behavior. Uh, Josh gave us a little bit about why he's interested. Chris, what, what brought you into this sphere? What uh, I know when we first started talking, you're you're right into the uh, neurological model of chiropractic. Uh, what? So, how did you get interested in in these types of questions? So, I think that well, I could talk on this for days, but <laughs> to sum up, I think in <laughs> same time, um, I think that for me, motor control is really and motor behavior is really a window into the underpinnings of the human system, and. I think that that in, in school and, and in and general medical education, we, we see and are taught a lot of anatomical distinctions that are thought to be a little more functional and distinct than they really are. And, and so what I mean by that is that, that the root of what I think a lot of human experience is lies in the nervous system and its extensions into other systems, which we can distinguish and say one is musculoskeletal, one is nervous. But in reality, in the body, those function very much together. And so for me, motor behavior is, is very much a blending of those fields in that it's, it's examining kind of the full system and saying, how do we get from, you know, a thought or a sensory integration, you know, sensory input integratively then to a motor output. And so as it relates to chiropractic, uh, I've seen some very, very amazing things happen in clinics that I don't think can be fully explained by either a purely uh, neurological model or a purely musculoskeletal model. And so I think motor behavior then for me, and in my opinion, was, was very much the, the in-between and the blending of the two that would let me go in and test and, and learn about those. Hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Josh, uh, I'll bring you in now. You, I basically roped you into this uh, collaboration. <laughs> Literally, uh, no, you were, you were a willing participant for sure. Like right away, I think as soon as I mentioned it, you were right on board. Uh, what, uh, you've been around us now for a while and you've been around chiropractic now for a long time. What, what is the, what's the draw for you? Yeah, I think Chris didn't say it this way, but I, I feel it this way is the, as a scientist and as a person, I don't know, let's go kind of mindset. Uh, I'm just constantly passionately curious about how people do anything. Uh, I'm curious about the the distance between intentionality and habitual behavior. And uh, I know one of my, I think, intentional keys of my personality and my professional life, but it's also habit for sure, is that I don't know, let's go mindset and so dean you invited me to to participate and uh of course i'm going to say yes uh, so <laughs> there's the, you know the technology side that you know i understand some some data processing and some perspectives computational perspectives of the movement behavior as we can measure it and there's the clinical side and, and the, the person patient side uh, that i i don't have in my my own training that is very intriguing to me. So the, the eye tracking is, is one good example. And I think Chris was mentioning some of these kinds of ideas that, uh, that people do more than just what the individual machineries that we could describe in the lab about the body, you know, is about. And so with eye tracking, I can watch your eyes move in a very specific way and then self-report. There's just no knowledge of it. Uh, and, and so having 
your your guys's you know perspectives interacting with with patients and, and knowing you know disease processes is, is just something i don't have professionally in my own wheelhouse um and and i think it's just a really cool merger of skill sets um we've talked a lot about continuous dynamics and it's one thing to stand up from a chair once in the clinic to prove you can and it's a wholly different thing to walk around your local community and have you know a, a quality of life about it and i think in my perspective and my or I, in my experience uh, especially the the two of you is that patient-centered real manifest of quality of life because of the care and treatment and the science around that uh, is, is something that I, I really like in our you know collaboration. So that's that really hooked me in right away um, to this team. Great. Uh, so I want to continue this conversation. I think uh, we're we're well on our way to people understanding you know why we got together and 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 how we have gone about some of these studies. Uh, so let's bring in our first study that we did together. And this was, uh, uh, called impact of extremity manipulation on postural sway characteristics, a preliminary randomized crossover study. And I think, uh, Chris would be, uh, uh the best one to, to perhaps give us an overview of this article, uh, because he was the one that had the idea for it. And, and I'm curious about what that motivation was. Uh, of course, I remember some of it, but maybe not all of it. So could you just give us a little bit of an idea of how the study came about, Chris? And um, and if you could give us an overview of it, too, that'd be terrific. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in school, I'd gotten very interested in, in the neurological side of manual manipulation. And um, so I'd been reading... Um, I guess not articles, but but thought by functional neurologists and 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 people who are more into the sort of neuroscience of manual manipulation, and I found that there there wasn't a lot of information on it. Actually, there was there was one particular review that said there's not enough and no information on it. So there was clearly a gap there, and that was an interest to me because I thought that was a good way to potentially give back to the profession and and look into this. And then in regard to to extremity versus spine. I think as chiropractors, we get very focused on the spine, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But we do, in in many places, have a scope that expands outside of that. And there are, you know, therapies and techniques that rely on extremities. But again, in the same way, and actually even more so than with spine, there there really wasn't any evidence looking at it and examining that. So for me, this felt like a very large gap that that seemed very naively easy to fill at the time. Um, but, uh, but so that, that kind of inspired the, the study and then the study itself, uh, was, it was a crossover. So we used a crossover design with, with healthy adult volunteers, with chiropractic students. And the idea was to compare the effects of upper extremity and lower extremity manipulations. And we actually did a series of manipulations. So the upper extremity group had shoulder, elbow, and wrist manipulated and, and the lower extremity group had hip, knee, and ankle and we wanted to see if that had any effect on quiet standing and then also balancing on a rocker board. And I, I would make this a shameless plug moment for the, co the cooperation we've had with the collaboration we've all had because I was just going to do quiet standing. And uh, thankfully, being paired up with, with you two guys, you said, hey, you know, quiet standing is pretty easy for normal people, for healthy people. So uh, you may want to add something more challenging. And so on, on your suggestion, we added the rocker board in. And we looked at some traditional measures of posture. So we looked at things like path length and, and range of sway. But then um, Josh also brought in his, his chaos and his nonlinear magic. And so we looked at sample entropy. And that was a means basically of examining our, the structure of the movements um, that, we, that we had in response or that our participants had in response to the manipulations and the tasks. And in a very cool turn of events, we found that the manipulations of both the upper and lower extremity uh, it led to decreases in those traditional measures, those, the path length and range, on that rocker board, but that um, that the participants um, stratified, I guess the participants didn't stratify, but the response then changed with the site of manipulation in regards to upper and lower extremity when we looked at sample entropy, so when we looked at that structure of, of movement. 
And so we found the upper extremity led to less structured and less rhythmic movements on that rocker board. And the lower extremity actually led to more structured and more predictable, repeatable movements. So it was a very, very cool result, actually. And, and um, I don't think what we were all expecting. <laughs> No, not at all. Not at all. And and we'll get to the other study here in just a little bit, uh, which also for me was quite a surprise. Uh, when, when we get to that, I guess we can talk about those findings. Um, yeah. And and so, you know, the big, the big thing for me uh, after we were done uh, with that study, looking at the rock board in particular, you know, the natural response for me was, well, if, if it can stabilize people on this, you know, spastic device, if you will, this rocker board, uh, I wonder what would happen to the elderly. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, uh, at increased risk of, of falls and they have a control system that, you know, tends to increase in, in the range of sway and that's been related to falls. So, uh, that's kind of where my headspace, uh, was and, and still is. Uh, and I think, uh, Josh, you know, has a, has a really interesting perspective on this. So I want to bring Josh into this again and, and have him uh, talk about a little bit of some of the biomechanics and motor control, especially with regards to the dynamic principles that, uh, Chris, you were just mentioning. So Josh has just an amazing skill set in both these areas. So Josh, I wonder if you could give us uh, some some basic thoughts about uh, what's what people describe as linear versus nonlinear or dynamical measures and, and what they tell us. Yeah, I'd have to be happy to. Uh, I think one of the foundational concepts first before we talk about measures is just to evaluate the space that's being considered. Uh, in the literature, a lot of the linear measures, there's you know summative or you do a 30 second balance trial and it's how much in the 30 seconds did you move like the path length or as far to the left or right as you move, that would be the range, but it's totally agnostic to the time nature of the trial. And so between studies, you'd, you'd make sure that you did a 30 second trial to compare to a 30 second trial, but there's no time information inside of the metric. Uh, and if you look at behavior, it's pretty obvious. Not every language uh, on the planet includes time context, there's past, present, future. But you talk to most people and there's there's a now and there's a soon and a later. And, and you kind of decide at the level of behavior when what you do matters. Uh, and so bringing that perspective just from, you know, a natural conversation into the curiosity of does the motor system contemplate at different time scales? Does it, do, you know, are, are the muscles activated later or is it always immediate? Every movement's immediate. And if, if there's a, a time bound nature to the control process, then time agnostic measures probably aren't going to reveal them. Uh, so things like those linear measures, the path length and range, uh, even a standard deviation, it's it still doesn't include a time component to it. But when you start getting into the, the nonlinear math uh, or you know, chaos math, complexity science math, the, the nonlinears, you start getting perspective on what's happening across time in a different way. And so the, the whole notion of a nonlinear system, if I can give you just a, a casual example, if you have an hourly pay job, you work an hour, you get $10, you work two hours, you get $20. That's a linear system. It's, it has a slope. You can plot that Y equals MX plus B. And it's clear and obvious what the output will be given an input. But a nonlinear system would be something like, I don't know, maybe if you were an Uber driver or a bartender or a server at a restaurant where there's more than what one parameter that goes into it. There's different scales and different complexity to it. So the day of the week that you're working or the time of the day that you're working or the whether it's raining or snowing, 
there's many things that factor into it. And so that nonlinear system, if you look at the flow of one parameter, you might get kind of a wiggly line instead of a straight line. And so there's different kinds of statistics like the sample entropy or um, there's many of them. Correlation dimension is one or the Lipman of exponent would measure like the cyclic nature uh, of a behavior. We, we've got these different tools that we can start probing and kind of asking, was well, this a short control process or, you know, of soon in time amount of control is control spread out across different time scales. Is it the same behavior over and over and over? Um, and that's a, just a fully different thing than the linear perspective, the, the summative measures. Um, and, and so in, in my view of it, that affords a different situation that we can be interested in. And, and so as Chris had mentioned, it, he was looking originally at this study as just static stance. And there was a comment, I think, that that would be easy for a, a, a normative, healthy person. And, and I think that's generally accepted. Putting them on rocker boards makes it harder, but it also, in a sense, makes it a very completely different thing. So when you stand on the ground, it's flat, it's constant, it's predictable, and it gets canceled out in the control equation. But once you stand on a rocker board, there's a variability, there's a, a response from the environment that it just makes it a different control equation, uh, at least from my perspective. Uh, and so I think that nonlinear skill set, that the toolbox really just adds different, you know, microscopes that you can see through. And, and my intention and in, in my research is just to use also those microscopes in different tasks than would otherwise be available. Like, walking on different surfaces at a time. People transition from the parking lot to the lawn when they go to the park. And that transition is kind of messy. So having you know, uh, tools in your, your calculation toolbox that can measure messy is pretty useful. Absolutely. And, you know, I guess the thing that really attracted me uh, when, when I was going through my graduate program to this dynamical nature of human movement was, you know, at the time, there was a set of literature that looked at uh, static measurements of posture. So high, you know, right shoulder higher than left type of thing, right hip, you know, higher than left hip. Uh, and there seemed to be some indication that, you know, that that might be associated with neck pain or, or what have you. Um, but this whole uh, way of looking at the dynamics of human movement in terms of postural sway and what you're talking about, Josh, in terms of chaos and complexity really, really got me thinking that this is something that we probably can and, and should do uh, within clinical treatment that, you know, there's something there. And I, I remember thinking and reading about studies, for example, those patients with Parkinson's who had more of a, a regular oscillatory sway pattern uh, compared to healthy controls. And I remember thinking that this is interesting. Uh, and then similarly, uh, but from a different discipline, if we look at something like heart rate variability. Uh, those who are sicker, we know have more regular heartbeats. I mean, they come on, let's say, every second, as opposed to 0.8 seconds this time, and then the next beat is 0.95 seconds uh, from the previous beat. And so it, it just seems that some degree of variability is important, uh, that it's related to health, and that we could capture this by looking at posture. So that's kind of where I came into it. And, and I think maybe that's why we get along so well. <laughs> yeah. And, and Dean, I think you mentioning too, the, the dynamical nature 
And and this resonates that that uh, time compartmentalization, but it's the behaviors that we're really most interested in, like standing as you do a task, uh, walking across the parking lot. You know, these are continuous behaviors. They are inherently self-informing. So as you take one step, you're creating the past of the next step, right? So every effort is connected to to the next one and the previous one in a real way. And it's, it's a very different thing that if you, you throw one dart, you can walk away and never throw a dart again, but it's, it's isolatable. And, but these continuous behaviors like walking, and that's where we see a lot of accumulated fatigue or, you know, chronic pain or fall events when the cycle goes awry. And I think that's something that I was trained also, you know, through my doctoral uh, program in Omaha uh, to really look at dynamical diseases separate than, you know, uh, an acute injury state. And so, yeah, I think we're in this really cool space where we've got these great different perspectives that add together. Yeah, definitely. Chris, any, any f- thing to add to, to that discussion? Um, I don't think so. I think that you guys really, really nailed it. Um, Josh, that was a great explanation. That was, the, that was super. The, um, you know, the only thing I would say is, is that I'd, I'm kind of curious to see, hopefully as this catches on, what kind of tasks people pick. I know that we selected the the rocker board specifically because it was so self-driven, right? The input or output from your right foot is, is going to go directly into the board and directly to your other foot. So it was very dynamic that way. And I know that, that I'm jumping ahead a little bit for the next study, but it is interesting to try and come up with different ways to test those kinds of things and to bring in those kinds of tasks that might be a little more dynamic and might be a little more, more self-driven that way. So I think that certainly an area to expand and, and I'm open to, be open to anybody's thoughts, but but certainly you guys right now on this is, is more tasks that could be used to kind of try and simulate this and and to bring home the model to, to something a little more clinical. And, um, you know, obviously we're not all standing on rocker boards all the time. For sure. For sure. Uh, but but it is a it is a convenient way to look at the dynamics for sure. And uh, we've we've got you mentioned the next study. So I think let's go ahead and do that. Uh, because in this next study, we chose a different task. Um, and so this study was called Immediate Impact of Extremity Manipulation on Dual Task Performance, a Randomized Crossover Clinical Trial. And uh, this was uh, published in Chiropractic and Manual Therapies in 2021, just uh, here recently. And so this, this came out uh, shortly after the study that we just discussed. Um, so... Chris, you were just talking about this. So this this is a different study. Uh, it involves a different task. Why did we come up with this particular task? And maybe you can describe the task a little bit. Yeah, so so the, the task we settled on was uh, using a PVC pipe, a six-foot PVC pipe that was, I think, two-inch in diameter that we half filled with water. And we had participants in this study holding this pipe um, with their elbows bent at about 90 degrees with explicit instruction to try and keep the pipe horizontal and, and parallel to the ground. And we actually selected this after quite a bit of deliberation. I, I specifically remember being at ACC rack actually, and we were all trying to figure out different different ways to test this, including up to and including, I believe, holding like a serving tray even and walking around. But um, the idea was to try and find a follow-up to the first study that was kind of an inverse test. So if we had upper extremity and lower extremity manipulations and we looked at a lower extremity-based task and a rocker board, what would happen if we gave them an upper extremity-based task? Would, would the same pattern emerge? Would it be different? Is it going to be task-specific? That sort of thing. And so we were trying to find a dynamic task that um, I wouldn't say it was analogous, or I guess analogous is probably the correct word, analogous to the rocker board, that would force someone to be in, in constant, um, constantly seeking for an equilibrium that way. And so for an upper extremity, the thing we decided on was, was this slosh pipe, this water filled tube. Yeah, great. Ed, so maybe you can just uh, go in and, and uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the study, how it was conducted, and then we can have some discussion about that. 
Yeah, so we we um, did sort of a similar crossover design, looking at healthy healthy volunteers, healthy adults, and we did a crossover again with the upper extremity and lower extremity manipulations. This time, uh, we actually did bilateral. So we did the same series, but we did both arms or both legs. And the tests were to have them stand on a force plate, and then while they were standing on the force plate, hold this um, hold this instrument, a tube. And we looked at the traditional measures again, path length, range, root mean square, and then also sample entropy for the um, for the standing, so the standing on the force plate as well as the tube itself. Um, we added in also an eye condition here, and we wanted to see basically if eyes open or eyes closed would have an effect on the performance of this task and then potentially on the manipulation. And this was another very cool and, and potentially counterintuitive finding, I think, which was that we found that um, there really was a big interaction between uh, vision and the performance of the, the balancing task. But very interestingly, it was more mediated by eyes being open than eyes being closed, which we expected to be, I think, the opposite, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, at least I thought so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, but so, yeah, so... Go ahead, think, yep. No, just, just that, that that was a, effectively how we came out on it. And, and as is typical, I've found in research at this point, I think we walked away with more questions than answers. But. <laughs> well, I think that's totally true of almost all research I've been involved in, uh, that there's tons more questions. Uh, and I think that's good. I guess uh, that, that means we've got many, many years of things left to investigate. Uh, so I, I see that as uh, some maybe some job security. So I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, definitely the the thing with the eyes uh, that people did better with the eyes open. I guess my thought, I'll just start with some discussion here. I was kind of thinking that, you know, you know, one of the things that we think about in in uh, chiropractic and and manual therapy in general is that what it what we do is we seem to stimulate receptors, uh, proprioceptors, uh, Golgi tendon organs, muscle spindles, etc., and that though that afferent uh, barrage of information into the central nervous system is a, seems to be a key mechanism for how chiropractic and and these manual therapies might exert their effects on the system and change motor behavior in that regard as well. But when we saw that the when the eyes were open, that ha had its greatest effect on this two balancing task. That was, yeah, that definitely blew me away. Um, because I was thinking, well, eyes closed, uh, you know, for driving more proprioceptive information that, that should lead to some, you know, the greatest change in motor behavior. But I guess what it does is, uh, you know, it opens up the possibility that there there's some kind of interaction with the visual system. And now we can probe that, you know, a little bit in greater depth there. But the other thing too, just from a practical standpoint is I don't know many people who are walking around on earth with their eyes closed all the time. So <laughs> it, uh, <Hopefully>. yeah, <laughs> yeah, hopefully not too many. Um, but you know, it, it does give some, does give some context to, to what we found. Um, Josh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and I think I, I kind of default to the a couple of general models thinking about the, the sensory integration for postural control, including proprioception, vision, vestibular sensitivities, and a, a psychological principle, this bottleneck theory of attention that drives the dual task design. And, and so I, I look at this kind of like shoving those two thoughts into the same space and, and trying to figure out how, do, how does it work? You know, so is, is there an attention allocation? Uh, is, you know, how in the brain is, is this information being managed? And again, keeping that, the, you know, time course concern on, on deck is, is that is holding this tube was an intention, but it didn't have criticality. Uh, like in the first study, if you fell off the rocker board, it could hurt. If you drop in this study, if you drop the tube, you kind of just failed the task. 
So there's a little bit of a different motive. And so there's a, diff, a different intentionality to it. And I think that shapes the control equation. Um, you know, when you close your eyes, you've turned off vision and you're aware of that. And the the tube had the water in it, it, it skewed proprioception. And so I think there's a difference in turning off a sensory modality than in skewing it. And in the same way, if you were to stand on foam, you're not turning off sensation, you're just distorting the value of it. And so I think we've got this set of conditions where there's there's a few things going on and and it might be that this this manipulation is amplifying the attention the inter- the neuromuscular attention to what's going on in a space that you know the upper or lower extremities the intentionality of the task matters and then the the cancellation or the skewing of information and it's you know, to my perspective, two of what needs to be 30 different studies before we can really start resolving <laughs> what's doing what. And even while we were talking, I, I kind of thought, well, we did, you know, lateral manipulations on study one, and we did bilateral manipulations in study two. We need to go back to the lab and get bilateral manipulations standing on the rocker board. We've talked before about Spinal manipulations, if we did a you know, central manipulation, what does that do to, to the sensory motor control processes? I, I think we're 20 or 30 studies away before we can really kind of capture what is the manipulation doing to these control processes under different contexts with different intentionalities and, and different uh, confounds. Like, you know, the the rocker board versus the tube they they are the closest we could figure out at the time uh, to to each other the, the most proximal analogs but they are not the same thing still so we're, we're still also trying to figure out you know what what is that upper body analog to the rocker board that has similar criticality or you know, that has the same heft or feel uh, and should simulate the you know each other um on the, on the different extremities so yeah i you know and i guess some some takeaways uh that that i'm thinking about would be yeah first that there are so many more questions uh that we need to try to answer second uh it gives it gives a little perspective i think on the task and the, and how important and how critical the task is. And that brings us right back to the beginning of our discussion about dynamics, that it really all depends on the task. And uh, so I think us choosing tasks from here on are going to be uh, of utmost importance. Um, and probably they're going to be tasks that people do, you know, all day long, walking, running, uh, you know, tasks of daily activity seem to be probably the best ones to look at. And maybe in the populations that are perhaps vulnerable, like I said, uh, elderly and and risk for falls, but I'm also thinking about uh, uh, athletes and, uh, you know, those sorts of things where stability, postural control is, again, also of utmost importance. So uh, curious uh, what what each of you, if you have any other further thoughts on, on that study of where we can go for that. Man, I mean, I think <laughs> any which way, right? We could go back and, and repeat the, the first one with, with some of the changes we made for the second. Uh, but then there's, there's any which way we can go otherwise. I know that personally, one I'm particularly interested in doing is, is going forward and, and actually trying to image the brain a little bit and see um, what, you know, EEG looks like or FNIRS or something like that looks like with, with extremity manipulation because we have some decent work already uh, on on spinal and the afferent barrage that comes from spinal manipulation. I'd be curious if that overlaps, if that's different. Um, and I think that potentially could could help uh, help inform some of the future studies we do in terms of how we think this is mechanistically working, what's going on, 
and and potentially even in categorizing some of the non-local effects that we've we've observed here. Yeah, totally. Josh, any I'd other thoughts? The opposite, yeah, I'd go the opposite <laughs> direction. Instead of zooming into the brain, I would kind of zoom out with uh, you know cameras and and look at the whole body movement. Um, there, there's a pretty significant literature in postural control that talks about movement strategies. So like hip ankle strategies, as you, as you rock forward and backwards, you can articulate at the ankles to achieve postural sway. You can also articulate at the hips, you know, lean, bending forward uh, at the hips to, to move your center of mass forward and backwards. And I, I would like to, to follow up and, and kind of probe in the rocker board study. Is there you know, different strategies? Is there knee flexion extension that happens to, to move the plate or you know, move the rocker board? Or is it in, in the pelvis? If we had the, the low back pain group, would they move differently? Would, would the manipulation kind of uh, loosen up the pelvis or the extremity manipulation would accentuate knee action, ankle actuation of the, the board. Um, and even with the upper limbs, that you can rotate the tube by doing bilateral elbow flexion extension, coupled flexion extension patterns. You can also lock your elbows to the side and, and rock the body sway. If you move your body left and right, the tube will have some rotation as a result of that. Um, so I would zoom out with cameras and look at kinematics, movement strategies um, with with those tools, those techniques. Cool. Yeah, I, I think both, both are great. And uh, again, just opens it up to a lot of study. So one one plug I would put out there for those who are listening uh, to the conversation that we're having, if you are interested in this kind of research and, and you want to help us to produce more of these kind of studies, uh, contact me or contact Chris or Josh. Uh, we, we could use funding. So <laughs> uh, shameless <laughs> plug, but, uh, but it, but it's absolutely true. Um these are the kinds of studies that we want to do and, and it does take money to produce uh, good research. So um, yeah, please, uh, please let us know if you're interested in that. Yeah. Uh, I'll never turn down. I'll yeah. never turn down funding, but uh, I, I'm very passionate that uh, if it's going to improve the quality of life of, of persons, uh, I'm, I'm happy to collaborate with anybody well motivated. We appreciate that, Josh, for sure. So, yeah, and I, I would just add very quickly on that, that, that yeah. I think we are seeing some really cool effects coming out of this and very interesting. And, and I think down the road, applicable effects. So it's not just sort of bench science where we're really starting to lay the groundwork, I think, for serious behavioral change and intervention. It definitely. Uh, I, I think I think chiropractors see this. Uh, every day in the clinic, uh, the kinds of uh, behaviors that we're observing in the lab. I think it's about translation now. I think it's about honing in, fine tuning our tasks. Um, and there's some interesting research that uh, the three of us have been involved with in terms of uh, spinal stenosis. Um, and I don't think we have time to talk about those findings today. Uh, perhaps I can have you both back on if you're interested and we can talk about those findings another time. But I think those are starting to show the, the very significant clinical effects uh, that uh, our, our care has on some of these um, dynamical measures, uh, for lack of a better way to describe them, performance measures, dynamical measures, uh, and the behavioral types of uh, things that, that, that we all study and that we like to study. Uh, for sure. So I, I look forward to uh, telling the audience about those kinds of studies coming up. But you're right, Chris, uh, that's essentially what we're gearing up for. And, and I very much look forward to to doing those studies. And again, uh, those kinds of studies will require some funding. So I appreciate anybody who might be interested in that. 
Now, before before we go today, I, I do want to talk a little bit more, just to get a little bit more background from each of you. You're in uh, interesting um, uh, careers, Chris. You're you're going to school, uh, doing your PhD right now. So, tell us, uh, you know, like part of the podcast is really to to interest people to get into science. Uh, and it's totally biased uh, because it's a chiropractic science podcast. I mean, we're trying to help chiropractors get into science, but you're there. You're doing it right now. I mean, you went directly from uh, Parker University uh, to the University of Houston doing a PhD in motor control. Can you just tell us about that transition and, and how things are going now? Yeah, for sure. Uh, for me, it was it was really pretty simple. I, I had an amazing amount of luck and and life fall into line. Um, you know, I was warned by about everybody I knew, I think that when I finished chiropractic school, that I would never want to go back to school. And the longer I waited and went into clinical practice, the less likely I would be going, I'd go back to, to get a PhD. So, um, I decided that was kind of the time to do it. And I think that realistically that was the right choice for me, at least I can't speak to anybody else. But I was, you know, fresh off of that, um, that first study in JMPT and was very enthusiastic and was very much in kind of a sponge mentality of, hey, let me go learn everything I can and, and become a scientist. And um, so going straight into the program was, was awesome when I was that, that motivated. And then the, the PhD program has been, I think, um, fantastic as a compliment to being a clinician. And I guess what I would say with that, if I was going to distill that down to be more specific, when you're a clinician, you have to have an answer, right? If, if someone comes into your office and says, Hey, you know, I've got low back pain. If you look at them and go, I've got no idea. Get out of here. <laughs> you're <a> very bad <laughs> clinician, right? Um, whereas if you say like, you have to know, hey, I'm going to try, you know, we'll have a trial of care, right? I'll, I'll attempt manipulation or I'll attempt exercise or some sort of rehab, right? Or, or hey, I'm not the person for this, right? You need to go get a surgical consult or you need to go see, you know, a rehab specialist, something like this. So you always have to have an answer. And, and in fact, I think just coming through through clinical rotations and, and being, being clinician still, I still work on the side a bit, you know, you still have to have an answer. It's kind of a dirty word to not, you know, dirty phrase to not. So as a, as a researcher, though, as a scientist, it's very important to acknowledge when you don't know, because it means either one, you need to go find out, or two, that there may not be an answer to that, right? That may be a gap that, that we need to address or that we need to keep in mind. So I think that was probably the biggest challenge in my mind was shifting my, my framework and my, my mental thoughts to say, it's okay not to know. And I need to instead look into it, make sure that I'm not just missing something, but acknowledge that there are limits to human knowledge and that that's potentially even an avenue to go forward into. But other than that, I've really had the most positive experience possible. So I'm probably the, you know, I'm, I'm the, the one end of the spectrum saying, yeah, if you're interested, go do it. <laughs> um, University of Houston's been awesome. I know everyone probably says this out of fear, but I'm saying this honestly, I have a great advisor. I really get along with him. And um, I've been learning a ton. And I would say specifically, if anyone is thinking about going into getting a PhD from chiropractic or from any kind of clinical science, I'd really recommend going outside of your profession. Um, I had the opportunity potentially to, to go and get a degree in something, some sort of chiropractic science, so focusing on chiropractic work and whatnot. And I think that I've added a lot of perspective and a lot of clinical, or excuse me, scientific acumen by going outside of the profession and going into something like motor control at a university that doesn't have chiropractic, isn't necessarily interested in that, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, you, the, the clinical program, like you say, and the uh, ac academic nature of the PhD, they're definitely different. Um, there's no doubt. You know, you know that once you pass each semester of chiropractic college, you're, you're close. Uh, doing a PhD is a little bit of a different animal. Uh, you know, you've got a, a committee <laughs> and uh, it may require multiple rewrites. And, and you really don't know, honestly, when you're going to be done. 
<laughs> it's a bit frustrating. Uh, so yeah, the, the two are significantly different. I, I do think they certainly complement one another, um, like what you're talking about. And, uh, I honestly think, uh, over the years, the PhD and, and teaching has made me a better clinician. Um, but you're right. I, 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 st- I think it's interesting. You brought up that dual nature of, you know, that you have to have an answer, uh, on the one hand as a clinician and as a scientist, you have to be kind of humble to realize that you don't have all the answers, um, and that you're seeking knowledge and that's part of what you, what you try to do. So I'm glad you brought that up. I think it's a really interesting point and it's, it's so true. Um, so Josh, uh, what about you? You're, you're at, uh, Oakland university. Can you tell us about, uh, your position there? What, what it's like being a professor and just being Dr. Hayworth? Yeah, thank you. Uh, a lot of interesting thoughts on my mind right now, just from that conversation. Uh, I think I come from the the uh, opposite from the clinical perspective that you must know an answer. Uh, I, I would generally argue that we can't actually know an answer uh, <laughs> ever in the in the way that it's it's kind of conceived of. I think obviously there's a one tangible reality that we're in at a moment. Uh, but I think our, our science speaks to the contextual nature of behavior and the, the kind of the area around that event that feeds into what's going to happen. Uh, you know, so I'm in this really blessed position here at Oakland University that uh, I get to champion, let's learn what we can. And that's, there's some realities to it. I mean, there, there's some fairly constant things about the universe, like gravity and friction, and there's observables and there's techniques, and we can learn these different uh, evaluation strategies, learn some calculations, measurements, statistics, these perspectives. But uh, as a scientist, I, I really refuse the potential to assert a final truth. Uh, Isaac Newton is a, an example for me. I teach biomechanics and the course is predominantly uh, work that he wrote. So uh, after a life of reductionist approach, let's portion it down into individual pieces uh, to put it back together and have a whole knowledge of the universe. We pretty well confess that even if you could, there's still something left. And I think that something is soon because there's enough variability in the world that even if you could know everything right now, pretty soon that picture kind of fades away. And that's like that meteorological map. We have a pretty good idea if it's raining right now and a pretty good idea if it's going to rain tomorrow, but by next Friday, it's kind of a coin flip, you know? And so I get to, it work here with a, a lot of students, faculty. We've got uh, clinical faculty here. I work with uh, medical students uh, on our campus, uh, physical therapists, my collaboration with the chiropractic community. Uh, and we've got students undergraduate, uh, master's students. We're starting a four plus one program uh, next year and a PhD track next year as well. So it's, it's this really blossoming environment that's full and rich of different perspectives. I've had students from engineering uh, work uh, with me in the lab uh, over here. We we use force plates, motion capture, EMG, to measure how people move and how people make movement decisions, the eye tracking, uh, the interpersonal uh, communication stuff that uh, is just, to me, really deeply interesting. And one of the things about Oakland University that I, I really love as well, and Dean, you touched on this, the, the value of teaching and how it informs your clinical practice. But I, I'm blessed here that my teaching is in part research. I actually get to teach research courses. There's research goes into my classroom. And Oakland University is a really cool environment where um, it is 
at the junction of teaching and research where these really cool things happen. Uh, and so it's not a teaching institution and it's not a research institution, but it is the at the junction of teaching and research and clinical practice. And it's all driven by how do we care for our community in the ways they need cared for? Um, so that's that's really awesome because that's that's what's deep in my heart. Um, and so I, I'll do a little bit of a plug too. If anybody's out there listening, interested in pursuing graduate school or undergraduate or collaborations, uh, my advice is to know your passion, uh, work on finding ways to identify communities of people that you can benefit through your work. And uh, I, I think there's a lot of ways to get there. And uh, if Oakland University is of interest, let me know. That's great. And uh, Josh, you may get uh, some chiropractors in the future coming your way for, yeah, a, ma- for a master's. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, we're getting close to the end here. So, uh, I have a question I ask every guest that comes on and I'm always curious to, to hear what people say, but, um, again, one of the motivations for doing the podcast is to, uh, illuminate chiropractors, illuminate, uh, the general public about what chiropractic science is about, but also hopefully to, to spur some, some folks on to go on and, and, uh, pursue a master's and or a PhD to also contribute uh, back to the profession in terms of the science. So Chris, I wonder if you could, uh, I know you talked a little bit about uh, your, your mentors, uh, your uh, um, folks at university of Houston, uh, but perhaps you could give us uh, maybe a little bit more insight in terms of what you would recommend uh, to folks that are pursuing any major tips uh, for, for folks. Yeah. So I think, and this goes hand in hand, I think with, with getting a PhD in general or, or a master's even, uh, persistence, (laughs) um, you know, it's, things may not look perfect at the moment. You may be saying, Hey, I've got to go back to school to get that. That takes time. That takes money. But I think it really is worth it. And I think that the profession really needs it. And in line with that, I would say that um, don't do it alone because there is kind of a feeling, certainly when I was in school, you know, the the class would say, we know research is important. We know someone needs to do it, but hopefully they'll come along one day. Right. And so there is that kind of isolation. I feel that, that, or a perceived isolation that is, Hey, you're going to go be the person to do this. And your friends are going to go into practice. They're going to start making money. They're going to start seeing patients. And I think that that is literally only that. It's only a perception. You know, Park University has been incredibly supportive. You know, Dean and Josh, both of you guys, uh, Dr. Catherine Pullman has been unbelievably supportive, Dr. Bill Morgan. You know, it's there's a ton, a ton of people out there that I'm not even mentioning because we'd be here for another hour who I didn't even know before starting this, who just me walking in the room and saying, hey, I'm interested in research and how can I help or you know, hey, here's a study I did, what do you think of it, have have absolutely bent over backwards to try and make me a better scientist and to, to provide me with all these opportunities. And I know that's not only my experience, having talked to a few other people now who have gone on to get PhDs. So if you are interested and you, and you are thinking about going on to become a scientist um, or pursue further education, reach out to everybody, let them know what you're doing, ask for advice, and you'd be really surprised, I think, what kind of avenues open up for you and what opportunities there really are for certainly for chiropractors going on. And then, and then I would imagine for, for any healthcare professional. Great. Uh, Josh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think persistence, perseverance, definitely valuable, but I I think there's a a patience and a a slow and steady nature. Uh, It was kind of to a, it was kind of an example that, uh, that I enjoy. It's, it's a TED talk, the, the first 20 hours. So it's a kind of a colloquial thing in, in motor control, motor learning, but it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert. Uh, and there's this general uh, concept that education means you know stuff. 
Um, and if, if you can kind of dig through those weeds, you can really find what, what I've seen in my career is that the reality is we, we maybe cannot actually know whole answers, but we can always work on the next thing. So if it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert, it's not even worth 20 hours to try, for instance, juggling or unicycling. It's intimidating, but we don't really have to be experts first. And so this kind of TED talk, I think beautifully walks through the first 20 hours is enough to be useful and functional. And if you spend 20 hours juggling, you're going to wow most of the people you would show your juggling skills to. And that's, that's kind of that next step, that master's degree or that PhD. It's, it's a pathway to what I would hope is better care, better knowledge on how to give care delivery. And, and again, pursuing it with how do I clear up an otherwise to date unknown thing? And just taking that perspective into it, I think, makes it easier to approach, uh, makes it more useful to approach, and just it it adds new perspective to medicine that I think is how we get better healthcare and not just applied old knowledge. I mean, we haven't you know reversed cancer yet, so we need new solutions. Uh, we, we've solved a lot of problems, and so we can leave those on deck to just, you know, use the current solution. But um, there's there's plenty of uh, disease states and, and injuries and things that need novelty still. And so uh, I, w- I would really kind of beg people to consider it that way is, is that we don't know yet. It's worth some effort to clarify something about it. And that could be the master's degree that could lead to that PhD and just slow and steady, slow and steady, persistent, uh, diligent effort to caring well for persons uh, is we we just need that in society. So. Oh, that's great. Fellas, like always, uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. I, I think, both of you get a, gave a great overview of the types of research that we're interested in uh, and, and what each of you are up to. And I think that will give some great context for people who might be interested in motor control and chiropractic, postural control, uh, anything dealing with motor behavior. So appreciate both of you. Uh, appreciate uh, you coming on. And, and uh, thanks so much for all you do. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Chiropractic Science with Drs. Christopher Malaya and Joshua Hayworth. I hope you have as much fun listening to the interview as I had recording it with these two fellas. Uh, it was great. 